Welcome back to That Wasn't In Your Textbook podcast, the place you come bi-weekly to uncover the things you always wish you learned from that boring, bulky textbook. I'm your host, Toya, and you're now listening to episode three, The History of Curating. this episode with a quick thank you um, to everyone for their continued support on this podcast. One of the main challenges of having a history podcast is doing the research and then from there figuring out the important things to share, the uncommon things to share, and a creative way to condense it into bite-sized information that will keep you coming back for more. So thank you for rocking with me on this journey. I am really excited about today's topic, the history of curating, because it was inspired by two things. The first thing that inspired this episode topic was, is the infamous museum heist from the Black Panther movie. Now, I'm just going to assume that everyone listening went to see the Black Panther movie. And if you haven't seen this hit movie that reached 1.3 billion worldwide and blue box office records out of the water, then I'm judging you. Anyway, the museum heist with Killamonger, aka Michael B. Jordan, Michael Bay Jordan, the villain of the movie, there's a part where he goes to a museum and he ends up stealing an artifact. But right before it gets to that crazy part, he has an interaction with the white curator there. At the British Museum, he asks her about various artifacts and where they came from, and she's telling him they came from different centuries and different countries. And when they get to the last one, He asks her, oh, where's this from? And it looks like an ax. And she says, you know, some country in Africa. And he corrects her and he tells her that it has magical powers. And she looks at him like he's crazy. And he's like, don't worry about it. I'm going to take it off your hands. And she's like, it's not for sale. And then he hits her with this line. How do you think your ancestors got these? Do you think they paid fair price or did they take it? Like they took everything else. Boom. So that part wasn't in another boom part. That's me. Um, so this was really interesting because it touched on an extremely, it touched on an extremely touchy issue that we're gonna dive into today, which is looking, which is like the question around how a lot of these curated museums, these art collections were acquired by colonizers and Europeans, especially during the height of colonialism. A lot of them, a lot of these items of indigenous groups were stolen or looted by colonists. And so this movie and this particular scene really showed that and it created a little debate around it. So that's some of what we're going to dive into today. The second thing that inspired this episode is the Stolen Goods Tour. And that is the name of a tour group that was giving tours in the British Museum last year, you know, before COVID-19, BC. (laughs) And it was an activist group that was giving tours to people that highlighted where the artifacts originally came from, the indigenous peoples in the countries that these artifacts were stolen from. And that activist group really called for museums to return these artifacts and artwork to these original groups. So those are the two main things that inspired me to do this episode topic. And I'm so hyped that we have our very first guest, Tyree Boat pates to talk to us about the history of curating. Tyree is a dear friend of mine, and I jokingly say that he is the mayor of LA because he's an LA native that's definitely in the know. Not in the streets, but in the know. He was recently on the cover of the New York Times in June, and currently he is the associate curator of Western history at the Archery Museum. And prior to that, he was the curator at California African American Museum. He also took me on my first gallery opening that had people like Tracy Ellis Ross, Brad Pitt, Thelma Golden, and even one of Barack's 
daughters were there. And that's just to name a few. There were some other people that I can't even remember. He also helped me come up with this podcast name. That's a story for another day. But thank you, Tyree. I say all that to say, it only seemed right to have a dope black man and friend of mine who's doing the work as our first guest. And at a time when many of us are spending some extra quality time with our families, maybe some of us are even quarantined with our families, and we're getting closer than ever. And then of course, this being a history podcast, I thought it was pretty fitting to sit down with the curator and talk about the collection of art and not just the fancy pricey shit you see on the art gallery and museum walls. You know, let's talk about the collection of art and archives that's in our homes and in our cribs, right? In in those photo albums, in that recipe book, in the saved wedding invitations, and the ver- and the other various items that are part of our own personal history. In the interview with Tyree, we focus on the current and future of curating and collecting art. We first start out by defining curating, and Tyree tells us the difference between curating, being a curator, and being a historian, because even I get the two confused. We also talk about how we're curating our lives digitally and how that may go down in the future and be a part of our textbooks. We learn about Tyree's really dope COVID-19 items collection project that you can actually submit to that he's doing as a part of his role at the Archery Museum. And then he gives us some tips on how we can collect and preserve the art in our homes and within our families so that it doesn't get stolen and so we don't get left out of history because you know who loves to keep us out of history. And we also take a deep dive in talking about the future of museums, you know, during COVID-19 and beyond. So before we jump in the interview that really focuses on the current state of curating and collecting art and curating for museums, let's learn a couple of historical things that we should probably know. Now, curating is a big topic, so I just drew out a couple of things that I thought were interesting, and just so y'all know I'm not making up shit here, all the information is based in research and can be found in every episode's show notes, so if you want to take a deeper dive and learn about some of the things that I mentioned, all the articles, books, videos are in the show notes. So let's jump right in. Let's start with the basics. What the hell is curating? The root of the word curating means to take care of. And back in the day when museums were created, curators' roles were established as the keeper and the collector. So basically, curators and curating is the idea of selecting, organizing, and looking after items in a collection or exhibit, and often in galleries and museums. Now, the world's oldest museum was built by a Babylon princess 2,500 years ago. Now, 2,500 years ago is marked as the time before Christ, or as the textbooks mark it, B.C., Side note, (laughs) I saw someone write a caption online marked BC before Corona, and I thought that was really clever. And it made me think about how this time period could, you know, that could totally be a label for a time period when they start, you know, doing stuff in textbooks and talking about this in school. Anyway, I digress. These BC, BCE, AD, 16th century, 18th century timeframes confuse the shit out of me. But that's something for a different day. But I'm going to try to figure out a way to make that easily understandable and digestible for myself (laughs) and for all of us. (laughs) But my bad, I digress. So the first museum was created 2,500 years ago in Babylon, which was a major city at the time. And if you're thinking, like, where the hell is Babylon, Toya? It's geographically located where modern day Iraq is. So this museum was discovered or found by this dude named Leonard Woolley a hundred years ago. And he was digging and poking around and he found, you know, things that were labeled and he found things that were in organized, that were organized in an organized system. And then he saw that there were different collections of objects 
kind of based on a time period. And so from his digging and poking around, he came with the conclusion that this was a museum, what we would call a museum, right, at the time. Because I don't think they were using the word and the label museum when this space was created 2,500 years ago. But when Lowly, when Leonard Woolley found it 100 years ago, he was like, oh, this is a museum. So the idea of collecting art and museums came from this concept called the Cabinet of Curiosities that was developed during the 19th century. Here I go talking time period. Didn't I say that was confusing? So the 19th century is considered like the Shakespearean Romeo and Juliet slash Columbus getting lost slash Game of Thrones time period. I know Game of Thrones is not a time period, but I'm just saying that's kind of what it's about, the 19th century. Now, the Cabinet of Curiosities was like a a room most of the time, right? And that stored and exhibited objects, antiques, artifacts, artwork, paintings, things that were considered rare and exotic, like dry dragon blood and stuffed animals. Yes, I did say dry dragon blood, and that is from a source, so whatever. (laughs) And oftentimes these cabinets would have like a theme, one of four themes. And the four themes that you could pick from. Um, They're usually traditionally listed in Latin and I'm not going to butcher their names or butcher your ears by trying to say them properly, but I'll just tell you the categories, what we're in each category. So one category would be stuff made by humans, like antiques and artwork, you know, paintings and stuff like that. The second category would be creatures and natural objects. The third was exotic plants and animals, and then the fourth was scientific instruments. In the modern day version of museums, you will often see things displayed in cabinets. And these cabinets of curiosity is where that all stems from. So if you think about it, I'm from New York, so I'm gonna talk about New York museums for a second, but if you go to like the Natural History Museum, you see like a glass encasing of stuffed animals. You know what I'm saying? You'll see like a line or something and it'll be a scene. So that's that blew my mind because I'm like, oh, wow, that's the cabinet of curiosities evolved. Whoa. Okay. So in many cases, these cabinet of curiosities was white explorers way of showing exotic collections of their travels that they traded and in many cases stolen. And these early traces is what Killamonger was talking about in the Black Panther. The idea that early white collectors, colonists, you know, were taking things from other cultures, taking and stealing things from other cultures as a part of their collections and curating. Today, in these current times, there's a call for decolonizing museums and their art collections. Pretty much asking museums to give people their shit back, (laughs) right? And so that will require museums to give people, black people and other PLCs, their shit back. So here's some interesting, mind-blowing facts. 95% of Africa's cultural heritage is held outside Africa by major museums. Should I say, I don't... 95% of Africa's cultural heritage is held outside of Africa by major museums. So that means that Africa, which is a continent, the largest continent, has only 5% of their cultural heritage of like, you know, think about like photographs, think about artifacts, antiques from their ancestors. They only have 5%. 95 percent is somewhere else. France alone holds 90,000 sub-Saharan African objects in its museum. If Africa was given back what they were owed, some of these museums would be on E, empty. In Senegal right now, they recently opened up the Museum of Black Civilization And they have a sword, an ancient sword, that is actually a part of their culture, but France owns it. So it's on loan to them from France. Imagine someone loaning you your shit, (laughs) and you have to give it back. So the argument back in the day with 
curating and these art collections in museums was that like places and countries in Africa didn't have the places to store such work. And this new This fairly new museum in Senegal is saying, that's not true. You can bring it here. So that is a brief overview of the curating, the history of curating, especially in the context of museums. Now let's jump into the interview with Tyree, where we talk about the current state of curating and the future. And we do a couple little games um, that are fun and tell us a little bit more about him and what he's doing. Welcome to This Wasn't in My Textbook Podcast. We have our first guest, Tyree here, who is, I call him the mayor of LA. I don't know if he like, he like always rolls his eyes at me. Um, But he's a curator, an educator. Uh, He has so many titles, a writer, you know what I'm saying? He was recently featured in New York Times. I'm not going to say too much because I want him to introduce himself. You know, and then today's topic is the history of curating. So it only made sense that we have one of the greatest curators, I feel like, present day that I know, that I know, you know, here to talk about it. <laughs> so, how you introduce yourself? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Tori, for this opportunity. And I'm so happy to be on your podcast. This is amazing. Um, my name is Tyree Boyd Pates. I am the curator of Western history at the Autry Museum of the American West and have been uh, since the start of this year and um, formerly was the curator of history at the California African American Museum where I was responsible for curating uh, history exhibitions and public programming uh, for this entire state and, um, and, and very much has informed my transition. So I'm glad to be here. I yes. feel like this is this, I can't believe this is happening. This is yeah, thank you for coming. Okay, so one of there's two inspirations for this episode. The first, if people remember, is from Black Panther. Like I instantly thought about that the museum heist with Killamonger and yeah. how he kind of checked, you know, that uh, white museum curator about you know asking her like, how did you get these artifacts? And so, and I just think in general that really sparked at the time. And even now, people still talk about it. Like, that sparked a lot of conversation around how some of these artifacts have gotten into some of these museums, specific, you know, specifically, like, these European um, spaces when we're talking about, like, 18th century, 17th century, some of these artifacts that are, for some cultures, like, spiritual and stuff like that. So that was my first inspiration. And I know for you, I mean, what black person didn't watch Black Panther? So... Did, did that spark a lot of conversation for you when that happened, or like, what was the yeah. response for you? Yeah, yeah, it, it did. So, um, yeah, so it, it was 2018, February, where um, that Black Panther came out, and that scene introducing Killmonger really, I guess, spoke directly to how Black folks have always felt about museums, um, the ways in which they've propped themselves up as the authority on um, particular cultures, um, foreign cultures, if you will, and the histories that surround them. Uh, what, what, what was problematic about that scene was that the curator was trying to tell someone who was indigenous to the Wakandan experience or ancestry uh, about things that were on view, and he was able to give her more science or math or intelligence about the materials before going to work on the staff. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that evoked not only a national conversation, but a museum-wide conversation after the Brooklyn Museum hired um, a curator to uh, curate African art who happened to, to not be African. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's when calls for decolonizing <laughs> museums as a whole ramped up. Um, yeah, I remember I remember that whole entire thing, you know, and I feel like I didn't like I thought about it, but I also didn't think about it because I think about like all the museum trips you take when you're in school and stuff like that. And I never really made that connection of, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that these are stolen artifacts and these are yeah. things that are sacred to people's culture that have been taken without their permission. 
yeah. you know um, I even read recently that like the 2000 like 2003 like the Iraq war there was like looting of like their museum and and like you know stuff were being sold on the black market and now it's in the museums and yeah. people are really trying to fight for you know them to be brought back into their spaces and um, there's a tour called the Soul and Goods Tour I know they did their first tour in May. I don't know what's going to happen now with COVID-19, but they literally went into the Britain Museum and took a tour of telling people where these things were taken from, right? When we talk about history, we're talking about, like, you know, a lot of history is presented in terms of prior to getting to the museum, but how did it get here? Like, you know what I mean? So I thought that was really mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> um to say the least. <laughs> to say the least, yeah. And, like, you know, we talk about history a lot in the past, but we're going to talk about it today, too, in the present, mm -hmm. um, and collecting things, and how we can curate our own history, you know, like, take control of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was a very interesting part. So the second thing that inspired this um, topic today is the wonderful work that you're doing um, with collecting COVID-19 artifacts mm -hmm. with your current role. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yes, gladly. Um, <laughs> so I, again, I just started the Theatri like five months ago. Yes, so, congratulations. Yeah. And congratulations I, on your, and he was featured in the New York Times for this collection. Yes, and, and uh, in the in lieu of joining Autry in January and uh, COVID-19 happening two months into my tenure there, I was so struck at the possibilities, right? The possibility of being able to tell stories about this moment, which we all find ourselves to be his, in historically, but doing it from a community lens mm -hmm. and having that serve as like an archive for our children's children. Yeah. <laughs> we always talk about like, what would we do if we lived during like the Harlem Renaissance or Great, the Great Depression or World War II. And surprisingly, if you look at it on paper, they're not too dissimilar <laughs> from where we are right now. I know. And yeah, so that hits the birth of the Collecting Community, the Collecting Community History Initiative, the West during COVID-19. And I think that's important and talks about kind of like the original, one of the original reasons why I started this, wanted to do this episode is how community can be a part of collecting archives. It doesn't have to be this like elitist thing where other people are invading other countries and invading <laughs> cultures. And not to say that everyone does that, but I think like this is also just kind of like you're reimagining how we collect history. Um, and it can be something that everyone can participate in, in terms of mm -hmm. what they want to be shared about themselves or their culture yeah. at, at a moment in time. Yes, yes, completely, completely. And um, being a curator in this moment, I find, being a curator, but also being a public historian at this time, mm -hmm. there's so many opportunities for us to really think about how we are curating or archiving this moment, um, outside of the four walls of an institution. And, you know, because people can't walk into the galleries. Yeah. And when they do, they'll have to stand six feet apart with masks on. So um, I'm, I'm just using the internet, digital means, my, excuse me, my team and I are using the internet and digital means to convey accessibility points or entry points to how um, they too are making history alongside us. Yeah, and what would, how would you define curating? Like, what is that? Yeah, uh, the definition of curating to you, uh, yeah. is what, what I said. Yeah, uh, the definition of curating for you, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. The definition of curating overall mm -hmm. is um, someone who is a steward of a particular collection um, or, or, or again an archive. Um, but for me, a curator is someone who stewards not only the collections but also the stories that surround them. And being a the, the connotation it's also someone who's an administrator an administrator mm -hmm. um, or a, a minister of culture like that's what a curator is and um, if you look at it on, on that face it's we are really intermediaries with showing the general public what um, this what their moment means what what their um, what what is of importance and that's a responsibility that is a uh, can be very weighty, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but definitely. also very exciting. 
Yeah. And how do you figure out what is important, right? Because we're also living in history and like, it's great that right now people can submit and um, take pictures and photos and writing and submit that to, I'll put the link in below for the podcast, but they can submit some of the experiences that are happening during this time period. But Mm -hmm. in general, as a curator, how do you figure out, you know, what, what to collect, when to collect as we're also living history? Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a great question. Uh, the appropriate answer and the answer that I lead in with would be listening. Mm-hmm. Listening to the communities that are on the ground or at the grassroots level to tell you as the curator what is of importance to them. Now naturally during COVID-19, the communities that are on the ground are the most susceptible, the most sensitive to not only the virus, but uh, extrajudicial killings and state-sanctioned violence and and other things that are occupying their survival. So uh, you you naturally have to allow them to exist in the moment without any interruption. Um, But in the meantime, uh, you you listen to find out what's of importance and then prioritize that in the historical canon. And that's what I do and have done for Black people and Black Americans in the West. Mm -hmm. Um, And now that I'm doing this for the COVID-19 project, I'm doing that for not only the black experience, but for the experience, experiences of all of those within that region. And if you listen closely, you can tell, you can, can, you'll find out what's of priority so that that's what we collect, or at least that's what they submit. So then that's what we collect. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, making it a community thing. Making yeah. it kind of like a thing of observation and moving forward from that is like really dope. What yeah. has been, you know, I know you've done some great exhibits, um, especially when you were uh, at CAM. So mm-hmm. this might be a hard question, but do you have like a favorite um, <laughs> exhibit you've curated so far? Because I know you're still, you have a lot more to go and I'm very excited yeah. for that. But is there yeah. like a exhibit that you really enjoyed so far? To choose one would be like almost choosing a child. Like, <laughs> I don't have any kids. I read so an I, article that said parents do have a favorite. Oh, they do. Yes, yeah. sure. they said I'm that parents parent, do I'm have a, a favorite. Long, really. <laughs> it's usually they said it, it's fluids, but it's usually the child that doesn't give them the most the most yeah. problems. <laughs> so there is. Yeah, I, I, they all naturally they all mean. Yeah, of course. Like, Okay, maybe you want to give me a top two that you really okay. enjoy. Maybe I should say favorite that like two that you enjoy the most. Sure. I'll make it easy for you. Um, I, this morning when I was preparing and looking forward to this, to this conversation, I was I, I realized that in like three and a half, four years, I did eleven exhibitions across the city wow. of Los Angeles, which isn't um, is is very um, difficult to sometimes wrap my mind around, um, given given the the depth uh, and the research that we did for all of them, my mm-hmm. team and I. But um, if I had to choose two, um, my f- two in this moment would be No Justice, No Peace, LA 1992, which mm-hmm. was a historical exhibition that revisited the 92 uprisings, but it over the course of a hundred year hist- uh, history in Los Angeles, um, looking at all of the civil uprisings that uh, went on during 92, the Lost Rebellion of 65, and the Zoot Suit Rebellion, the Zoot Suit Riots of the 1940s. And how each and every single one of them informed each other, and how um, naturally housing discrimination, inaccess- inaccessibility to quality education, and racism and police brutality constantly create these moments. So that exhibition was really successful. It had a police car in it, and uh, it was it's, it's something, it was my first introduction into the field. Mm-hmm. Um, my other favorite one would be uh, probably Cross Colors Black Fashion in the 20th Century, because I closed the chapter that I had at CAM, and that was a 100-year retrospective on the ways in which Black fashion in America um, has always been political and would be responsible for creating a multi-billion dollar uh, hip-hop apparel industry by ways of a brand in Los Angeles called Cross Coast. So each of those, both of those, were, are my babies. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was many heads that worked on that pro- on those projects. 
Um, and it, it's something that is linked directly to my success in this field as a curator and as a historian. That's good to know. I saw the cross-colored one, so yeah. I really, yeah. really enjoyed that. And it was, it was, it was really. I like the way that you kind of, the way you kind of the timeline of how you talked about the evolving of different styles and the brand with the different moments in history. I thought that was really beautiful. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And do they, that exhibit is closed now, correct? Or? And a lot of them are closed uh, because nobody can walk yeah. into it, but it's it's up through August. Mm -hmm. um, but given that COVID-19, we'll see if um, many of the museums in Los Angeles can open before the summers end. And so I hope that the world, I, hope I get to see it one more time yeah. um, if it is expected to come down. Okay, yeah, that's really good. So I was going to say, because like so many museums now are, are digital, right? They're doing these virtual tours. Yeah, um, yeah. Are there any recommendations that you have for like some exhibits or tours that people should check out? Yes, there is one that I really think a lot of people should see. So the exhibit... That I, the top exhibit that I would recommend people to go see when it loads on my computer would be da, 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 would be the Keith Haring John Michael Basquiat Crossing Lines exhibition. Okay. Um, it is a phenomenal exhibition that gives you an immersive understanding of how um, hip hop and John Ma Michael uh, John Michelle Basquiat um, were interwoven. Uh, and, and where what museum is this with? This is, this is with NGV, I mean, okay. I mean a, a Google search. Okay, I'll put the link in the um, in the oh, description, Google but I'm just like, is it a, okay, that's, that's really good, I didn't even hear of that one, because I definitely yeah. want to do that. I did a little, I did a virtual tour of the, is it the Lynch Museum, is that the correct name of it? Okay. Um, in Alabama. It was a little heavy, but it was it was interesting that I could see it and not, you know, especially being in LA, like just the, the access that you sure. have. Are there any sure. um, other like websites or like uh, Instagram accounts? I just feel like what's great about now is that people are really finding out of the box ways to archive mm -hmm. history. So if someone yeah. is just starting out, like what are some recommendations in terms of just like going to galleries or going to exhibits or just learning? Because curating is really just like you said, like collecting information. Yeah. Um, where would you tell them to start? Well, well, that's that's uh, just to parse through that um, question. It's mm -hmm. really important just to make a very uh, significant distinction. Yes. So, being a historian is one who collects. Yes. But being a curator is one who selects. Okay. Ooh, so someone's writing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna write that down. That okay. Was a fine. So, thank you for giving me one back. Yes. So, a curator, a historian. Collects, okay. but the story, but a curator selects. Got and it. so I wear two hats, literally, mm -hmm. where I'm collecting the histories of the present during COVID 19. Mm -hmm. But I select which ones are presented in um, a particular physical or digital capacity. Got it. And that's an important distinction because it, in, it can inform the ways in which the entry points is to which your, our listeners, your listeners will like, engage with how they want to get involved. And so my recommendation if people want to become historians and want to collect, okay. they sh they could do so in their home while they're quarantined by looking at some of the things that they've been eating, drinking, writing, and reading. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and those things naturally in 10, 15, 20, 100 years will be valuable in telling how they existed in this moment mm -hmm. as individuals and also a part of the larger community. Mm -hmm. But if they want to join and become curators, yes. out of that, those things that they select collected mm -hmm. in their homes, um, they will have to make a very intentional selection of those things that represent the time and the moment that they found. So it could be out of that selection I just offered. It could be the the book by Octavia Butler called Parable of the Talents, mm -hmm. where you wrote all of your notes about the similarities between the quarantine and the book and how it made you feel. Mm -hmm. um, and the, your journal entries both alongside it. Like 
that tells me the Tyree story of the quarantine. That's, okay. a, that's, a, that's, a, personal, that's a personal tell. Yeah, so, that was a great one. So then I guess kind of piggybacking off of that, right? Sure. Because history is also present. So I have two questions from this. You just got them in my mind. Yep. So history is also present. So like if someone, like you said, I think you might have answered this one, so you can just let me know. But like if someone wants to collect things, right, whether that be about this moment, COVID-19, or they have a grandma who's 91, what are some things they should collect Um I guess if we use the grandma example, but like what are some things they should collect about their family history if they wanted to do something like that? During COVID-19 or just in general? In general. And you can, if you want to, yeah, you know what I mean? Just in general. Like if some people want to collect an archive, I think a lot of people are doing family trees and tracing. So just like what are some things you recommend that they collect and select? (laughs) That's great. Um, The good Excuse me. The good thing about black grandmas and just grandmas in general, <laughs> is that they are natural historians. Uh, yes. Because usually they've lived long lives and and have co- co- collected things along the side that life mm-hmm. um, that they feel should be passed on to future generations. Yeah. So using their expertise and wherever they keep those treasures, <laughs> thumbing through them, yeah. and uh, finding old photos naturally, um, old. Uh, Recipes, yes. old um, you know, you know, journals, diaries, and journals. Yes, mm-hmm. you, you read me to it. Records, maybe records. The, all of those things are ripe for yes. uh, collecting. Yeah. Um, but then ultimately, what informs the selecting is um, what's that one object? What's those two objects? What's those three objects that say this was my grandmother during this time? Mm. This is my, this is my daddy one during this time. This was my mother during this time. And that's how um, you can narrow down that selection. That's great. So then continuing on with your your poetry and poetry of collecting and selecting <laughs> um, and talking about history now, yep. I feel like, you know, like social media, like when you look at like Instagram and when you look at Twitter even, there are even some accounts that are dedicated to kind of collecting um, yeah. archival information um, and so how do you, is it proper to say that we're curating is it proper to say that we're collecting because I even think about the like okay even in the sad terms like you know like I scrolled through my Instagram and I can go all the way back I haven't deleted it I'm not one of those people who have deleted their old ones but <laughs> like you know I can I'm like oh wow this is my life this is my life five years ago this is my life and I think about even when people pass you know they're their Instagram and their Twitter remain, right? And so, like, when we talk about our own personal history and curating our lives, people always like, people are like, curating, you know, people always hate on Instagram and say people are like fake curating, right? Making it look perfect. Um, But either way, you know, it's about your selection. And so is it proper to say that we're curating our lives or collecting things? or And how do you think that will impact how we look at history or how museums will collect history on even just like individuals. Oh yeah. Okay. Come through with the question. <laughs> These are great. Thank questions. you. Um, that's a, ooh, that's a good question. I would say for those on the ground, mm-hmm. um, who are curating their lives and lifestyles, uh, at the end of the day, that all will serve as an archive that will inform how many of us were existing in that moment. Mm -hmm. Now, what people are collecting within their lives and choosing to present, Mm -hmm. that is, that still tells us something too. Um, And to some degree, that is a form of curation because what a historian would then dig up Mm -hmm. is what did they not include? (laughs) in the presentation, Mm -hmm. right? Because there's so much more to a person than just the one image. But if you're intentional enough to to use my metaphor or my example, Mm -hmm. what we, the highlights that we present on the gram is in fact just that, that one thing, that one moment, that one instance that completely encapsulated that moment that we want to present to the world and future generations about how we existed at that specific time. And that is curation. That Mm -hmm. is curation. Mm 
Because mm-hmm. you know what they didn't include? They didn't include <laughs> the LED LED light or with the ring light that's in the background. In the background <laughs> that gave them that angle, that gave them that that lighting. They didn't you know? include the face tune where they pinched their nose, <laughs> or, or the time where they when they um, took the deep breath to hold in their, their, their uh, hold it in. Their, Holding that quarantine fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> on the waist trainer, that's underneath the outfit. Like you know, and I'm just, I'm, I'm not just hitting on women. I no, think, no. Uh, let me just everybody does it. Everybody does it. Women drum beers and add you know top two pays whatever. <laughs> All of that is a gay curation, but it still very much informs um, how uh, historians will collect this moment mm-hmm. and ultimately tell. It. So you know, and, and this isn't new to the brand. People have been doing that for. For centuries. Yeah. So, how do you think with that, right? How do people, are there any other current moments besides COVID 19 that maybe happened in the past yeah. three to five years that you found yourself mm. collecting for? Oh, boy. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. So, the question is, how have I um, collected? Yeah. Like, before? you know, because I feel like history is also present. That's like what I keep saying. Yeah. And so, like, what are some other things outside of this large moment um, or other moments in history or time that you've been collecting, I guess, in the past three to five years? Um, I would say what I, my first entry point into collecting Mm -hmm. on a historical vein where a lot of brothers can definitely identify is sneakers. Like, Mm -hmm. sneakers being of major importance to not only us as a culture, but to specific moments where our favorite athlete performed a particular action and we wear those shoes in real time. Last dance, I think about the last dance. <laughs> where where um, Jordan took the last shot and you have his shoes on and you, you may not have been at the last shot or saw the last shot if you're young. You probably weren't you even know, born either for some people. Right, right, right. But you know that the shoe not only does it have sentimental value, it also may be very valuable on a on a on a commercial side mm-hmm. in keeping and retaining and ultimately using um, to ride, drive down the drive the price up in the future. So my entry point was sneakers. Uh, I still collect sneakers to this day, nice. um, and I have shoes that are um, as old as uh, 17, 18 years. Yeah, um, uh, but but they are archival pieces that I won't sell nor give away. Um, and even occasionally will wear just for for um, shock value. Yeah. So, you know. you, that made me think of even like my mom, and I feel like a lot of people's parents did this, like when Obama won the election and they went out and they yeah. got all the newspapers, all the both. magazines. Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, I recently was like helping my mom declutter and that's we found those. Yeah. I was like, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're not throwing this out. She's like, you're gonna make me throw everything out. And I was like, we're not gonna throw this out. This is collector stuff. This is right. history. Right. We're gonna right. we're gonna uh, take care of it so it's preserved and it's not just in your closet. Right. Right. <laughs> but you know, I think you know, I think about that when we were talking about even just like our parents, grandparents, mm-hmm. like they have been collectors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Collecting recipes, collecting moments in history. Like my mom even had like some covers of. You know, unfortunately, like Amadou Diallo, like the newspapers and just some of those those moments in time that have happened. And Mm -hmm. those are archival moments. Completely. And um, and they possibly were collecting because they know that this stuff would never end up in a museum. Mm. Right. And that also is a form of resistance um, to, you know, mainstream views of what archiving is for black folks in communities of color. And so shout out to the grandmas and elders grandmas, who collected yeah. things who, were, who we thought were hoarding, but it's like, <laughs> they were, but they were archivists. Though. Yeah, they're, they're like, you don't know what you're talking about, little girl. <laughs> you don't know, this is Al Green. <laughs> but, but can I give, can I give some, of course. Example? Mm-hmm. So um, I was working on an exhibition with uh, my team at CAM called The Liberator. Um, the, it's called The Liberator. And uh, uh, my uh, colleague was was who the exhibition was about, and she worked on preserving her family's history for over a hundred years. Mm-hmm. But when we were collecting uh, the items that we were going to use in the exhibition, my assistant history curator went with her to the 
their home to get some of those things. And they had the first edition of The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois, the first edition of Up From Slavery from by Booker T. Washington and others. And mind you, these books are just sitting in the cut and collecting dust. But if you look online at the appraisal value of those books, they are north of $5,000 individually. Mm. And, and, <laughs> and so I say all that to say that like, what we may even take for granted as um, in our homes, that our elders may take for granted as homes, is real significant um, worth, yeah. not only to us sentimentally, but again, commercially. And um, and I hope that people look at COVID-19 in the same way, not to say that you're trying to capitalize or cast out on COVID-19, yeah. but it's saying that like this will someday be of value. Mm-hmm. How are we choosing to collect it and preserve it? Yeah, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you. So I think I have one more question, then we're going to get into games. Sure. That was a sure. really good way to end it. Sure. So, um, how do you think this pandemic is going mm-hmm. to affect the future of museums? Like, I know we're talking about curating, which is collecting, sure. but sure. in terms of seeing some of these collections, um, mm-hmm. I know you said that we're going to have to be six feet apart and have masks, but mm-hmm. are there, um, I mean, you're because you're in the know, you know, what are some mm-hmm. of those conversations and what are the ways that people are reimagining? showing some of this history. I, I think the future of museums and the future of collections has always been what the present is, and that is, will we, we can we show it, when will we show it, and who deserves to see it? Mm. In this moment where accessibility, even to the own staff that is responsible to be custodians of these materials, um, can't even walk in because of um, social distancing, they are resorting to technological means to present it. And I think if the museums at their core want to rise to the occasion to meet this moment, they have to. Like they, it, it, it is of the utmost importance to open up entry points that think beyond the brick and mortar and let the public see how they've always been inside of the collections, or at least let them expose you to how there are glaring blind spots within um, your collection. And those conversations are going to only enrich the museum experience pre-COVID, mid-COVID, and post-COVID. And I think if museums want to be relevant in, in the next generation, not only technologically, but you know, just you know, relevant, mm-hmm. um, they have to do that. And I'm proud to say that the Autry um, allows its curators to meet this moment head on. That's great. I'm inter- I definitely see, I definitely have been enjoying the um, virtual tours. I feel like I've been, I've been all over the world at this point, um, right. going to different museums. Yeah, like, oh, we're going today, I'm going to the loop, you know? So it's been, it's <laughs> exactly, it's been really interesting and I hope that it continues. Um, and I'm interested to see how all things evolve due to this okay. pandemic. Okay, we're gonna get into the game. So I have a game called This or That, and it's a game where I give you two options. They're usually very similar. And you'll have to choose. Mm. I'm not timing you, but you know, we're gonna do like a rapid fire, you know, so don't take too long. Mm. <laughs> um, I don't have a Jeopardy sound though. And then I won't give you any context for them, but they're mm. all related to what we've talked about in this conversation mm. to some degree. And then I have like one random curveball which has nothing to do with this conversation. Okay. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so <laughs> this is a hard one. Um, kill a longer or chala. <laughs> uh, Killmonger. Guggenheim or MoMA? Oh, you're, you're gonna give me in trouble. I know. <laughs> MoMA. Okay, um, book or photo? Book. Instagram or Twitter? Twitter. Physical or digital? Physical. <laughs> Okay, the curve mall is Family Matters or Fresh Prince? Uh, Fresh Prince. Uh, that was easy, right? Okay. Yeah, easy. <laughs> and then easy. my last question is, is to wrap it up, because we're all um, experiencing quarantine. I know some of us are in different phases based on the state. You know, if you were to dedicate a chapter of your memoir to this yeah. year or to this moment in time, yeah. what would your chapter be called? Ooh, this chapter would be called actualized. Okay. Um, 
and the reason why is because I just got out of my Saturn's return. And if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's like the the end of your twenties, early thirties, where you feel like you're an insecure episode that doesn't turn off. <laughs> That was the greatest analogy. <laughs> Longer than 30 minutes. <laughs> it's more than 30 minutes. It's actually an hour. Uh, a few hours, actually. Um, but I feel like in this year um, and in this moment, all of my, uh, my, my skills, my potential, my expertise are finally um, converging. <gasps> and I um, am actualizing in a professional capacity, a personal capacity, um, a creative capacity, and I, I'm proud to be able to be my full self in this moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for You're being one of my first guests on this show. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> And that is the conclusion of our first episode with a guest on the history of curating. If you made it to the end of this longer episode, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Remember to check out the show notes. I'll include a link to the exhibit that Tyree mentioned that includes Basquiat and Keith Haring. And I also will include a link to his COVID-19 artifacts project that he's doing as a part of the Archery Museum. And so you can literally submit your photos, your writings, your audio that you've been taking during this pandemic so that you too can be a part of this time period in history. If you haven't already, make sure you follow us all over the interwebs. We have an Instagram, a YouTube, a Twitter, and all of that. So if you want to see the visual of this episode today, you can go to our YouTube channel. That wasn't in your textbook. And if you haven't already, we've had a lot. If you haven't already though, please take your time to leave a review for our podcast on iTunes and make sure you subscribe. Reviews help us get noticed, help us um, rank higher in the searches. So thank you so much again for watching. And remember, knowledge is power.